Welcome to Stories with Liz. It's time for another Anton Chekhov. This one is called The Beggar and was first released in 1887. Kind sir, have pity. Turn your attention to a poor hungry man. For three days I've had nothing to eat. I haven't five kopecks for a lodging. I swear it before God. For eight years I was a village school teacher, and then I lost my place through intrigues. I fell a victim to calumny. It is a year now since I've had anything to do. The advocate Scorsov looked at the ragged, fawn-colored overcoat of the suppliant, at his dull, drunken eyes and the red spot on either cheeks, and it seemed to him as if he had seen this man somewhere before. I have now had an offer of a position in the province of Kaluga, the medicant went on, but I haven't the money to get there. Help me kindly, I am ashamed to ask, but I'm obliged by my circumstances. Skortskov's eyes fell on the man's overshoes, one of which was higher and the other low, and he suddenly remembered something. Look here. It seems to me I met you the day before yesterday in Sodovaya Street, he said, but you told me then that you were a student who had been expelled and not a village school teacher. Do you remember? No, no, that can't be so mumbled the beggar, taken back. I am a village school teacher, and if you like, I can show you my papers. Have done with your lying. You called yourself a student and even told me what you had been expelled for. Don't you remember? Skortskov flushed and turned from the ragged creature with an expression of disgust. This is dishonesty, dear sir, he cried angrily. This is swindling. I shall send the police for you. Damn you! Even if you are poor and hungry, that does not give you any right to lie blatantly and shamelessly. The waif caught hold of the door handle and looked furtively around for the antechamber like a detective thief. I, I, I am not lying, he muttered. I can show you my papers. Who would believe you? Skortsov continued indignantly. Don't you know that it's a low, dirty trick to exploit the sympathy which society feels for village school teachers and students? It is revolting. Skortsov lost his temper and began to berate Medicant unmercifully. The imprudent lying of the ragamuffin offended what he, Skortsov, most prided in himself his kindness, his tender heart, his compassion for all unhappy things. That lie and attempt to take advantage of the pity of its subject seemed to him to profane the charity which he liked to extend to the poor out of the purity of his heart. At first the wave continued to protest innocence, but soon he grew silent and hung his head in confusion. Sir, he said, laying his hand on his heart, the fact is, I was lying. I am neither a student nor a school teacher. All that was fiction. Formerly, I sang in a Russian choir and was sent away for drunkenness. But what else can I do? I can't get along without lying. No one will give me anything when I tell the truth. With truth, a man would starve to death or freeze to death without lodgings. You reason justly, I understand you, but what can I do? What can you do? You ask what can you do, cried Skorskov, coming close to him. Work, that's what you can do. You must work. Work, yes, I know that myself, but where can I find work? By God, you judge harshly, 
cried the beggar with a bitter laugh. Where can I find manual labor? It is too late for me to be a clerk, because in trade one has to begin as a boy. No one would ever take me for a porter, because they couldn't order me about. No factor would have me, because for that one has to know the trade, and I know none. Nonsense! You always find some excuse. How would you like to chop wood for me? I wouldn't refuse that. But in these days, even skilled woodcutters find themselves sitting without bread. Hush! You loafers all talk that way. As soon as an offer is made you, you refuse it. Will you come and chop wood for me? Yes, sir, I will. Very well. We'll soon find out. Splendid. We'll see. Squirso hastened along, rubbing his hands, not without feeling malice, and called his cook out of the kitchen. Here, Olga, he said. Take this gentleman into the woodshed and let him chop wood. The tattered Emilian scarecrow shrugged his shoulders as if in perplexity, and went irresolutely after the cook. It was obvious from his gait that he had not consented to go and chop wood because he was hungry and wanted work, but simply from pride and shame, because he had been trapped by his own words. It was obvious, too, that his strength had been undermined by vodka and that he was unhealthy and did not feel the slightest inclination for toil. Squarzo hurried into the dining room. From its window one could see the woodshed and everything that went on in the yard. Standing at the window, Squarzo saw the cook and the beggar come out into the yard by the back door and make their way across the dirty snow to the shed. Olga glared wrathfully at her companion, shoved him aside with her elbow, unlocked the shed, and angrily banged the door. We probably interrupted the woman over her coffee, thought Skorskov. What an ill-tempered creature. Next he saw the pseudo-teacher, pseudo-student, seat himself on a log and become lost in thought with his red cheeks resting in his fist. The woman flung down an axe at his feet, spat angrily, and judging from the expression of her lips, began to scold him. The beggar irresolutely pulled a billet of wood toward him, set it up between his feet, and tapped it feebly with the axe. The billet wavered and fell down. The beggar again pulled it to him, blew on his freezing hands, and tapped it with his axe cautiously, as if afraid of hitting his overshoe or of cutting off his finger. The stick of wood again fell to the ground. Skorskov's anger had vanished, and he now began to feel a little sorry and ashamed of himself for having set a spoiled, drunken, perchance sick man to work at menial labor in the cold. Well, never mind, he thought, going into his study from the dining room. I did it for his own good. An hour later, Olga came in and announced that the wood had all been chopped. Good, give him half a rubble, said Skorsko. If he wants, he can come back and cut wood on the first day of each month. We can always find work for him. On the first day of the month, the waif made his appearance and again earned half a rouble, although he could barely stand on his legs. From that day on, he often appeared in the yard and every time work was found for him, now he would shovel snow, now put the woodshed in order, now beat the dust out of rugs and mattresses. Every time he received from twenty to forty kopecks, and once even a pair of old trousers were sent out to him. When Skorskov moved into another house, he hired him to help in the packing and hauling of the furniture. This time the waif was sober, gloomy, and silent. He hardly touched the furniture and walked behind the wagons, hanging his head, 
not even making a pretense of appearing busy. He only shivered in the cold and became embarrassed when the carters jeered at him for his idleness, his feebleness, and his tattered fancy overcoat. After the moving was over, Swartzko sent for him. Well, I see that my words have taken effect, he said, handing him a ruble. Here's for your pains. I see you are sober and have no objection to work. What is your name? Lushkov. Well, Lushkov, I can offer you some other cleaner employment. Can you write? I can. Then take this letter to a friend of mine tomorrow, and you will be giving some copying to do. Work hard, don't drink, and remember what I have said to you. Goodbye. Pleased of having put a man on the right path, Skvortsko tapped Lushko kindly on the shoulder and even gave him his hand at parting. Lushko took the letter and from that day forth came no more to the yard for work. Two years went by. Then one evening, as Skvortsko was standing at the ticket window of a theater paying for his seat, he noticed a little man beside him with a coat collar of curly fur and worn sealskin cap. This little individual timidly asked the ticket seller for a seat in the gallery and paid for it in copper coins. Lushkov, is that you? cried Skorskov, recognizing in the little man his former woodchopper. How are you? What are you doing? How is everything with you? All right. I am a notary now and get 35 rubles a month. Thank heaven, that's fine. I am delighted for your sake. I am very, very glad, Lushkov. You see, you are my godson, in a sense. I gave you a push along the right path, you know. Do you remember what a roasting I gave you, eh? I nearly had you sink into the ground at my feet that day. Thank you, old man, for not forgetting my words. Thank you, too, said Lushko. If I hadn't come to you then, I might still have been calling myself a teacher or a student to this day. Yes, by flying to your protection, I dragged myself out of a pit. I am glad, indeed. Thank you for your kind words and deeds. You talked splendidly to me then. I am very grateful to you and to your cook. God bless the good and noble woman. You spoke finely then, and I shall be indebted to you to my dying day. But strictly speaking, it was your cook, Olga, who saved me. How's that? Like this. When I used to come to your house to chop wood, she used to begin, Oh, you soot, you! Oh, you miserable creature! There's nothing for you but ruin! And then she would sit down opposite me and grow sad, looking into my face and weep, Oh, you unlucky man! There is no pleasure for you in the world, and there will be none in the world to come, you drunkard! You will burn in hell, Oh, you unhappy one. And so she would carry on, you know, in that strain. I can't tell you how much misery she suffered, how many tears she shed for my sake. But the chief thing was, she used to chop the wood for me. Do you know, sir, that I did not chop one single stick of wood for you? She did it all. Why this saved me, why I changed, why I stopped drinking at the sight of her, I cannot explain. I only know that, owing to her words and noble deeds, a change took place in my heart. She set me right, and I will never forget it. However, it is time to go now. There goes the bell. Lushkov bowed and departed to the gallery. The end. Amazing what a little kindness can do. <sighs> Hope to see you next week.
Bye for now.